Welcome everyone to another social emotional workshop. Today we are with Henry Ford Health Systems. Lisa, we are so glad to have you back. Lisa is going to be talking to us today about addiction. Welcome, Lisa. We're so happy to have you. Hey, thank you. I'm happy to be here. So I'm a social worker at Henry Ford Maple Grove Center, which is the premier substance abuse treatment program in the state of Michigan. We're located in West Bloomfield and we are part of the Henry Ford Health System, but, but in a separate building, not in the main hospital off to the West. And we do treatment for adults and adolescents who have alcohol and other drug problems. So I'm here to talk to you today about addiction. So think to yourself, do you think addiction is a disease? Okay, so if you said yes, you are correct. So addiction is a disease recognized as such by the American Medical Association in 1966. It's not a choice. It's not a character weakness. It's not a criminal mind. But on the surface, it seems that way because many people think, well, if you just don't pick it up, you won't use it, problem solved. And if it were that easy, we'd be out of business. So it truly is a disease. And this is a disease that's chronic, meaning once you have it, you always have it. So let's say that I have an addiction and I've been clean and sober for 20 years. That disease is still in my body and if I should start using again after 20 years, the disease picks up where it left off. It's not like I get a fresh new slate because I've been clean 20 years. It's still the same body. And this disease is progressive, meaning it gets worse over time. If a person continues to use and does nothing to stop or to um, get treatment, it is very likely that this disease will get worse. And this disease is primary, meaning you can be in perfect health in every way. And if you have an addiction, it is a number one primary disorder. It needs to be treated just like any other medical problem. And this disease is familial. We'll talk about that shortly. It runs in families and it can be fatal. So when I do a presentation to people, typically about 50% of people in the room know someone who died of addiction, which is really sad, but it is the reality. And the bad news is this disease is not curable. The good news is that it is treatable and it is very successfully treatable if a person does what they're told to do. But as humans, generally, we don't do everything we're told to do. So how would you know if a person had an addiction? Well, the, you're familiar with the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. We've talked about that before, and many of you know about it anyway. It lists all the mental health and substance use disorders and the criteria, the symptoms need, needed to meet the diagnosis. So there's 11 different criteria for addiction. We call it substance use disorder. So that's the umbrella term. But under that is alcohol use disorder, cocaine use disorder, heroin use disorder, but substance use disorder is the umbrella term. So there's 11 different criteria, and we're not going to talk about them all, but if you're interested in looking them up, just Google DSM-5 substance use disorder criteria. But the main ones are a loss of control. So the way I explain that to people is if we went to a party, we might have a drink or two and then be done and not think about it again, maybe until we went to another party. But someone who loses control is going to have one or two or 10 and they still can't stop. Now I'm using alcohol as an example, but the drug doesn't matter. It could be a line or two of cocaine, a pill or two, it doesn't matter what the drug is, it's still the same disease. So that's a loss of control. Another sign of substance use disorder is continued use despite adverse consequences. So bad things happen. People crash the car, they overdose, they get fired from a job, they get divorced, they, you know, they end up in an emergency room, and yet they continue to use. Most of us, after one of those things happened, would say, okay, I get the message, I need to stop. 
but they don't. They continue to use. And it's not because they're stupid. It's because they can't stop. And another one is the compulsion to use. Okay, the obsessive thinking and the compulsive behavior. So the way I explain this is we all like pizza, right? We'd like to have some pizza right now. But if we don't, maybe we'll have it tomorrow. Maybe we'll have it next week. And the thought of pizza leaves our minds. But with someone who has the compulsion to use substances, it doesn't leave their mind that easily. And it's not just, I want it. It's how am I going to get it? How am I going to steal for it or pay for it? How am I going to hide it? How am I going to use it? How am I going to recover from it? And how am I going to get more? Okay, that is what runs through their minds. And it doesn't leave their mind as easily as pizza leaves our minds. And then with this disease, another component is denial. Okay, as humans, we've all been in denial. You know, our pants are a little bit tight and we think the dry cleaner shrunk them. But the truth is we gained weight. So people are in denial all the time. But with this disease, the denial is very, very significant, in part because there's a negative stigma in our society against people with substance use disorders. But also there's a lot of guilt and shame and embarrassment with this disease. So who wants to admit I'm a drug addict? I'm an alcoholic. My son's addicted. Okay, most people don't want to admit that, so the denial is incredibly strong. So who is at risk to become addicted? Well, there are certain risk factors, and one is genetics. If it runs in the family, you were born at a higher risk. So it could be great grandparents, grandparents, parents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins. If anybody in your family has an addiction, you were born at a higher risk and it's unpredictable. It's like you never know who in the family is going to show up with blue eyes. You don't know who in the family is going to have an addiction. So it hops around. Um, it could skip generations or not. It could, um, you know, it, it could be in every generation. It could be male, it could be female, it could be both. It hops around. So there's no way of predicting. Another risk factor is mental illness. So anything from depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, ADD, um, you know, eating disorders, schizophrenia, any type of mental illness puts a person at a higher risk of addiction. And it is very, very common to have a co-occurring disorder, a mental health disorder and a substance use disorder at the same time. In fact, more than 50% of people do, so most do. And the early use of drugs is a significant risk factor as well. And the reason for that, as I'm sure all of you know, is brain development. A person's brain is not developed until the age of 25. So what if they start using regularly at 15? They're priming their brain for addiction for the 10 years it takes to become fully developed as an adult. So the earlier a person starts using, the more likely they are to become addicted. And what do you think about social environment? Think to yourself, is that a risk factor for addiction? So we're talking about people you hang with, friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, teammates, classmates. Is that a risk factor? And most people will say yes, and that is correct. But does it cause addiction? So the answer to that is no, because addiction is not contagious. But what we commonly hear from parents of our adolescents is he's addicted because of his friends. Okay, no, he's not. He's addicted because of his body. He's exposed to it because of his friends. But parents, especially of adolescents, are quick to blame others. Okay, so you may hear that from the families you work with. Childhood trauma is also a huge risk factor. So trauma means different things to different people. We typically think of abuse, physical or sexual abuse, neglect, but trauma could mean watching your dog get killed by a car, watching your house go up in flames, having your parents go through a contentious divorce, being bullied as a child. Those are, risk, those are traumatic events 
and trauma actually changes brain development. So someone who's been tra traumatized as a child is more likely to grow up to become an adult substance user. So that is a risk factor as well. And what about stress? Do you think stress causes addiction? And many people will say yes, but the answer is no. Everyone's under stress. I know that you're all under stress, but not all of you are addicted. But some people cope with stress by using, and for them it works, at least temporarily. So they keep doing it and doing it and doing it, and they become addicted. They didn't intend to become addicted. They only intended to feel better. But some people cope with stress in other ways, by exercise, listening to music, painting, doing woodworking, reading a good book. And those people are not gonna become addicted. So assuming that I have no risk factors, it's not in my genetics, I'm not mentally ill, I didn't start using young, it's not in my social environment, I've had no childhood trauma, and I am not under stress. Could I become addicted with zero risk factors at my age? So the answer to that is yes, because I'm human. Just like we're all at risk of any other chronic illness or acute illness, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, asthma, we are all at risk for a substance use disorder. It's just that some people are born at a higher risk. So it's an equal opportunity disease. It doesn't matter if you're young or poor, young or old, rich or poor, you live in the city or the suburbs, you're black or you're white, you're Christian or you're Jewish, it doesn't matter. Because we're human, all of us are at risk. And have you heard the term rock bottom? I'm sure that you have. And they say that addicts need to hit rock bottom before they get help. And I'm happy to say that that is not true. You can arrest this disease at any stage along the way, but the true rock bottom is death. And we don't want people to die. But before people die, there's always another bottom. For me, if I got one drunk driving arrest, that would be my bottom. But some people get two or three or four and they still haven't hit their bottom. But once you die, there is no other bottom. So the goal of schools and of the criminal justice system and hopefully of parents is to raise the bottom, to give consequences so that they don't hit death, the, the real rock bottom. So whose decision is it for an addict to get help? It's them and only them, okay? So just like you can't lose weight for someone else, you can't enter recovery for someone else. So if you're working with a family, you're working with a teen and the parents see that the teen is using and they really don't have a lot of control over what happens, it's the teen's decision, where does that leave the parents? A pretty hopeless and helpless and feeling out of control. So, um, everybody understands, I hope, that alcohol is a drug. So drugs do three things. They change the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act. And of course, alcohol does that. Alcohol is a drug. But you'd be amazed how many people in our society don't recognize that. It is a drug. And the drug of choice doesn't matter. So if I prefer cocaine, and Tony prefers heroin and you like alcohol. Okay, it's not that you're better than us because alcohol is legal and heroin and cocaine are not. The drug of choice doesn't matter. It's all the same disease. And have you heard of cross addiction? So I could be addicted to two drugs at the same time, for example, air, alcohol and cocaine, or I could stop using alcohol and pick up another drug like Vicodin. And if I'm truly an addict, it is very likely that I could become addicted to Vicodin. So now I'm cross addicted again, and the Vicodin use could lead me back to my use of alcohol. But you can also be cross addicted to a behavior. So we're talking about gambling, overeating, sex, pornography, internet, shopping, shoplifting. And these behavioral addictions could lead me back to my use of substances. 
So what we're seeing now with sports betting being legal, we're seeing gambling addiction increase, as sad as that may be. So let's talk about the family. If only one person in the entire family is addicted, the entire family is said to be a chemically dependent family because everyone is impacted. Everyone from the little kids up to the grandparents. If somebody loves an addict, they're going to be impacted by this disease. Um, children need to learn about their family history. Keeping it a secret does them no favors. So it's no different than me. I was born into a family rampant with heart disease. I knew more about cholesterol at age 10 than any kid on the planet because I had to learn to keep my weight down, exercise, eat right, see the doctor, etc. Kids who grow up in families with addiction need to know the same thing because they need to know that they were born at a higher risk and their genetics are different than their friends. So when they start using, they can't compare themselves with their friends. And some will make the decision never to start using. Some will decide to use anyway and be careful. And many will, can, will use anyway and become addicted, unfortunately, because of their genetics. So keeping it a secret in the family, not sharing it with the children, does them no good. And then many people say, well, we don't have it in our family. But if you dig deep, you might find out that old Uncle Joe, who hasn't been in touch with anyone for 20 years, it might be because he's addicted. It could be that somebody who died young died of addiction. But many times these things are not talked about in families. So being very open and honest, especially with children, is very, very important. So at what age do you start to talk to kids about addiction? Well, you can start very, very young. I'm not talking about teaching a two-year-old about injecting heroin, but you are gonna teach a two-year-old about keeping their body safe and clean and brushing their teeth. And as they get older, you know, wearing a seatbelt, wearing a helmet and making good choices and choosing good friends. And then as they get older, teach them about smoking and drinking, et cetera, and teaching them about their genetic risk so that by the time they become teenagers, they've heard a consistent message throughout their life. So um, you may have heard the term codependent. So often what we see when someone is addicted is family members are codependent. That means they're so sucked in and so enmeshed with the user that they really don't have their own identity. So the way we explain this is, the user is addicted to their drug. The codependent is addicted to their addict. And that's not healthy and that's not safe. And people who are codependent often enable others. You may have heard the term enabling. So people who enable mean well, their heart is in the right place. They're doing what they're doing out of love. What they don't realize is that their enabling behavior helps the disease to progress, which is the exact opposite of what they really want to do. So I'm gonna give you some examples of enabling. There's thousands and thousands of enabling behaviors, but they generally fall into three categories. So one is getting between the person and their consequences. So if my husband calls me from jail again tonight to bail him out, and I do, and I bring him home to our nice, warm, cozy house, I'm getting between him and the consequence of spending the night in jail. Another example is doing for someone what they can do for themselves. So let's say he's out partying at night and wakes up sick in the morning. I could call the boss and say he can't come in, he's got the flu, but he could call for himself and he could lie for himself, but I'm doing that for him. And another example is engaging in behaviors that perpetuate the problem. So I could drive him to the crack house. I could smoke marijuana with him. I could have beer in the fridge and I'm engaging in behaviors that perpetuate the problem. So family members who enable do it unknowingly. They do it with the best of intentions, but they don't recognize that their behavior is helping the disease to progress. 
So what do you do about codependency and enabling? You get people educated and you get them help, you get them support. So just like you've heard of Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, and there's other support groups as well that people who use substances can go to, to literally work 12 steps to help them recover from substance use disorder. Family members can go to Al-Anon or Naranon or Families Anonymous, which typically attracts parents. And there's other support groups as well where they can get help for their enabling behaviors and their codependency. And they can literally work 12 steps to help them deal with this very, very difficult and stressful disease in their family. So if we're going to talk about addiction, we have to talk about recovery. And recovery does not just mean stop using. That is sobriety. That is not recovery. Okay, so you may have heard the term dry drunk. It's a person who is not using any alcohol or any drugs. They are completely sober, but that does not mean they're in recovery. What that means is they're generally pretty crabby, irritable, difficult to get along with people because they've stopped using, which is their coping tool, but they haven't replaced it with anything else, like any spiritual or psychological support. So a dry drunk is sober, but they're not in recovery. A person who is in recovery has made a conscious decision to stop using and has taken steps necessary to support that decision. So for example, let's say to today I decide to enter recovery. Okay, what might I do? Well, I might go into rehab. I might start attending 12-step meetings. I would clean out my house and get all the alcohol and drugs and paraphernalia out of my house. I might tell everyone I know I'm in recovery, don't offer it to me, don't bring it around me, don't be high around me, might change my phone number or block some numbers from my phone. Okay, and then I'm working a recovery program. That's recovery. So you may have heard the term relapse. Relapse means starting to use again, after a period of recovery. So I'm going to give you an example and you think to yourself, did I relapse? So let's say that I live in Michigan, I'm a drug user. I go on spring break to Florida with my family and I'm not stupid enough to bring anything with me on an airplane and I don't know anybody there who can give it to me. So for a whole week, I don't use. My vacation is now over, I come home to Michigan and I start using again. Did I relapse? So if you're thinking yes, you're wrong because I never entered recovery. All I did was interrupt my use to go on vacation and then I returned from vacation and I resumed my use. That's not recovery. Remember recovery is when a person makes a conscious decision to stop using and take steps necessary to support that decision. I didn't do that. All I did was go on vacation. So when you hear that addicts relapse all the time, if you're defining relapse properly, like the way I define it, the relapse rate with this disease is no different than the relapse rate for any other chronic illness, like heart disease or diabetes. So you could have, you could have a, some diabetic problem you need medical care, you get treated, and then you're doing okay. And at some other point in your life, you're gonna have a problem again, and you're gonna need medical care, and then you'll do okay, and some other time you'll need medical care. So you've relapsed throughout your life. Substance use disorder is a chronic relapsing disorder. That doesn't mean that everybody relapses, but many people do. I know many people who have never relapsed. And when I've asked them, how is that possible? Their answer is always the same. I did absolutely everything that I was told to do. But again, as people, we don't do that. So people who do what they're told to do can very successfully navigate this disease and put it into remission. So it'll never be a cure, but it's in remission in their body. So how do you treat substance use disorders? Well, there's inpatient treatment, 
which we call rehab, people get detoxed. That means the, the drugs are in a medically supervised environment taken out of their bodies. It's a pretty uncomfortable process, but if they're in a medical facility like ours, then they get medication um, to help them. And there's comfort meds as well. If people have headaches or anxiety or diarrhea, they can treat that. And then inpatient treatment, there's intensive outpatient programs. There's regular outpatient, meaning one-on-one -on -one with a therapist. There's early recovery groups. And there's always 12-step and other support group meetings, which we highly recommend to everybody who um, comes to us for treatment. The same exists for family members, the support groups, the, the therapy, the counseling. And the way of the future, which we're all going to be hearing about more, thankfully, is what we call medication-assisted treatment. So there's medications like Anabuse, that's very, very old, and newer ones like Suboxone, Vivitrol, Camprol, which helps people with alcohol dis use disorders and opioid use disorders to get help, okay, to remain substance free so that they can continue to go to work, take care of their kids and function in the world. So you're going to be hearing more and more about medication assisted treatment, and there's going to be more and more new medications that are developed over time. So we're very much looking forward to that and very grateful for that. So with that, I wanna ask you, do you know anyone in your life who is in long-term recovery? So if you're thinking about it and you're saying, no, I really can't think of anyone. I guarantee you, you know many people who are in long-term recovery. You just don't know that they are because they haven't told you. But they're your friends, your friends' parents, your neighbors, your teachers, your doctors, your coworkers, your nurses, your kids, friends, parents. There are so many people, over 23 million Americans, who are in long-term recovery, doing well, successfully navigating this disease, and they just blend into the rest of us. So you don't know that they're in long-term recovery because they haven't told you, but they are. So everybody knows people. But typically, when people say no, why should they believe there's any hope with this disease if they don't know anyone who made it? Okay, but I'm here to tell you that all of us know people who made it. So with that, um, we will open it up to any questions that you have, Tony, or comments. Um, wow, is is just eye-opening and mind-blowing um, what you're saying that people are who have the proclivity to be an addict are in this state and um, I, it just is amazing. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. It's a really tough life. It's a really tough life. Um, we have to have compassion toward people because it could be any one of us. If you've got students whose parents are addicted, I can guarantee you they don't want to be addicted. People who come to us are disgusted with themselves. They have very low self-esteem. They're feeling incredibly badly guilty. Nobody wants to have this disease. Wow. So we have to have compassion. Indeed, indeed. Um, it, it's not even a question uh, for the individual struggling because they are facing defeat every single moment that they can't withstand from whatever it is, you know, that they have become addicted to. Right. And so um, it, it sheds a new light and puts this in a new perspective because I really did think it was a choice. Yeah. So, so I can tell you that it, it's not um, because if it were a choice, almost 100% of the people that I work with would choose to stop. And they can't. And we have people who come back to treatment multiple times 
They tried, they've done everything they could and something happened where they relapsed. But you never, ever, ever give up on anyone. They could be in treatment 10 times, but the 11th time is when it clicks. So you never give up on anyone. And when you, and I will tell you, I know many people, including some coworkers of mine who are in long-term recovery. And when they tell me stories about what their life was like when they were using and the things that they did, and I look at them now and say, that was you? You did those things? It doesn't make sense because I find them to be the most upstanding, wonderful, honest people who were doing all sorts of criminal behavior to support their addiction. And that's not who they are today. And it's very heartwarming to see that people can change. Wow. So that's why you never, ever, ever give up on anybody. Well, all right. If you guys don't have any more questions or comments, um, yeah, it is very helpful, Jamie. Um, so, Jamie, I will tell you that I have many people in my life, you know, family, friends asking me, how could you work with addicts and like it? Okay, how could you do that? So my answer to them is, what area, what other area of medicine can you work in? where 100% of your patients have the opportunity to turn around their lives. People are gonna die of cancer. They're gonna die of heart disease. Yes, they're gonna die of addiction, but they don't have to, right? If they, if they enter recovery, they can live a very happy, healthy, productive life. So to be part of that process of making that happen for people is heartwarming to me. And I just love what I do. Good deal, good deal. Thank you so much, Lisa. Excellent presentation. And we will see you on Thursday for vaping. I'm, I'm looking forward to that presentation. I, I truly believe that one's gonna be very awesome. They're all awesome, but um, going through the PowerPoint um, is gonna be very informative. Yeah, I hope so. All okay. right, I will see you on Thursday. Bye, you guys. Thanks for joining. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.